Pefa from India. So really, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I really enjoy um, also seeing uh, colleagues and, and friends, um, either online or, or, or offline uh, in Chennai. I, I wish I could be there, but at the same time, it's better for everyone <clears throat> that I'm not here today because I'm suffering from a little bit uh, a small sickness that everybody knows about. And so it's better for me to be online and stay away from everyone. So today um, I'm going to talk about uh, LiDAR observations from space. Um, most um, and, and, uh, and the Calypso Spaceborne LiDAR. Calypso is um, a satellite which was launched in 2006 uh, to unveil the vertical structure of aerosol and clouds in the atmosphere. Calypso, since 2006, has been operating. Initially, the mission was supposed to be um, was supposed to go on for only a few years, but I think there have been a fantastic team at uh, at NASA Langley who has been able to um, sort out issues with with technical issues with with the, the sensors and the satellite platforms. And now it has been <clears throat> more than operating since more than 16 years. So during this presentation, I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to give a, a slight, a small introduction about Calypso, especially for students who are not familiar with uh, space-borne LiDAR. Uh, I will speak about global aerosol distribution of, of um, <clears throat> from the Calypso, from Calypso observations, which has been um, really a, something which uh, has revolutionized the way we, we look at the atmosphere, really having those global observation, aerosol and clouds and their properties as is, is really a unique aspect that Calypso has been able to, to bring. And the last part of my presentation would be more on my area of expertise, which is more the upper, the upper at atmosphere, the stratosphere, and how uh, Calypso and Spaceborne LiDAR are important to monitor uh, stratospheric aerosols. So, as I said before, um, <clears throat> Calypso has been operating now uh, since 2006. Uh, the Calypso Spaceborne, the uh, Calypso platform, Spaceborne uh, Space platform, is composed of three sensors: a mixture between active sensor, a lidar, and two passive sensors, an imaging infrared uh, radiometer at three wavelengths, and a wide field camera. And the purpose of of combining uh, active and and passive instruments was was really to enhance uh, our ability to derive information on aerosol and clouds using a combination of LiDAR observation and, and, uh, and radiometer, allowing to also <clears throat> try to in extrapolate the LiDAR information to a greater uh, uh, area, SWAT, thanks to the, to the radiometers on board. Yes. Uh, from the beginning, Calypso really provided some astonishing uh, observation of the Earth atmosphere. And as I say before, uh, combining passive and active uh, measurements have been key also to try to understand how our atmosphere works. Here's an example, <clears throat> 2008, of a Calypso orbit track in, uh, in red on top of uh, an RGB um, image from the MODIS, the medium resolution spectral radiometer on board the aqua satellite. MODIS gives a, an overall large swat of the uh, of, of the earth of the earth in a 2D dimension and the LiDAR penetrates through the earth to give the three-dimensional component, the vertical component. And so at that time this orbit track of Calypso was actually uh, passing across West Africa, capturing some dust coming out from uh, from the Sahara Desert, and and it's it's really it's really the the key here is is to see that how before with two D the two D perspective how we were limited in the way we could understand the atmosphere, and the lidar perspective allow us to derive the vertical distribution of aerosol and clouds. Here we see that most of the <clears throat> the aerosol layer, the dust, is actually between five and seven kilometers, and we see on the northern part, um, on the southern part, sorry, 
of the orbit trap, we see orbit track, we see some clouds, high altitude clouds near 15 to 17. So already, <clears throat> again, combining those measurements have been, have been really important to unveil uh, the, the distribution of aerosol and clouds in the atmosphere. Here's a, here is another example combining uh, the Calypso Spaceborne LiDAR. So you see the curtains here are, are coming from the, from the LiDAR and <clears throat> the 2D view, uh, aerosol view from MUDIS. And without entering into too much details, would say that <clears throat> if you see the orbit tra track passing through um, India and across the Himalayas here, we see that both uh, uh, radiometer and LiDAR see an announcement of aerosol at the foothill of the Himalayas where pollution builds, especially um, after the monsoon and during the winter time. And so really having the, the 2D distribution of, of aerosol, spe spatial aerosol from MUDIS combined with vert vertical structure uh, from Calypso gives another dimension on those aerosol layers. And the gray here, here the gray layers corresponds to <coughs> clouds, which have been are detected at higher altitude, while most of the pollution across India is at, at lower altitude here. Uh, another interesting feature is the dust here coming from the uh, Arabian Peninsula that is observed uh, through this orbit track. So <clears throat> really just want to give a little bit more information about what is Calypso. So Calypso is uh, the, sp the spaceborne platform hosting a LiDAR and two uh, a passive instruments, one radiometer, infrared, and one wild, uh, uh, wild uh, field camera. The LiDAR system, as it's going to be the focus on the workshop, is <clears throat> more or less the same than a ground-based LiDAR. It's composed of a transmitter, which transmits uh, la laser beams at two different wavelengths, at 1064 and 532 nanometers. And along their trajectories, when the LiDAR is obviously from space, so it's looking downward and uh, along those, uh, those laser beams, light is backscattered from any aerosol or clouds which are in the atmosphere. The backscatter light is then um, <clears throat> measured through a telescope on board. And, and, and the, the measurements are divided into two channels, one at 1064 nanometers and two channels at 532 uh, across an orthogonal and orthogonal polarization channel and cross polarization channel at 5.32. Here is an example of a, a profile <coughs> obtained from Calypso. So what is important here is to realize that the measurements made from Calypso are attenuated measurements, it means that the laser uh, uh, beams are attenuated uh, through when uh, across, across the layers which it crosses. So the blue line is the molecular backscatter coming from uh, molecules in the atmosphere at 532 nanometers. And we see that the theoretical mo molecular backscatter here deviate from the LiDAR profile because of the fact that actually all those layers between 12, 14, or 6, and 10 kilometers are att attenuating the, the, the laser beam. So it's an important, as important information from a regular backscatter LiDAR since the atmosphere attenuates the LiDAR beams as it goes from, from the ground when it goes up and from space when it comes down, attenuated by the layer it crosses. Here I, I, I really want to, to give some general um, <clears throat> slides about the application of, of using spaceborne LiDAR. Here is an example of using Calypso to track uh, dust coming out from Africa. Dust is coming out from Africa in, in summertime, in spring and summertime is highly important because it affects not only air quality possibly um, in, in Central America, but also it affects the formation of cyclone which can uh, affect um, the US, US coast. Another impact of dust crossing uh, the Atlantic is its transport across the Amazon basin, basin, where the dust can actually transport uh, also phosphorus, which can feed the vegetation. So this this shows um, five days of Calypso observation across the Atlantic, 
and the spaghetti lines are the trajectories which shows how the dust is transported. Dust is around from the ground to around three, uh, three to seven kilometers high. And here is a little bit uh, more, if, if the video wants to play, a little bit more a concept of uh, space-borne observation of, of dust. It shows actually how satellite imagery can show the 2D structure of dust. Here it was an image from MODIS, which shows the dust in a 2D dimension. Um, coming from, from Africa. And the Calypso Spaceborne LiDAR shows dust distributed to the air column. And, and really having the vertical information of the dust is very really important because the dust is not transported in the same way, but near the ground or at six, seven or eight kilometers, depends on the wind speed and the wind direction. And here is, is the, those curtains of, of Calypso as the dust crosses the Atlantic basin and reach uh, the northern part of South America and also the Amazon basin. Why it's important, as I said before, is because as the dust move across the Atlantic, it carries with him nutrients and those nutrients which cross uh, the ocean eventually would um, be deposited and they will be deposited across the Amazon, the Amazon river. And the transport of those nutrients is different between the season. In summertime, in spring and summertime, there is usually more transport of dust because of uh, the weather conditions. And this dust gets transported and, and, and deposited. Uh, <clears throat> so really from the time <clears throat> Calypso um, started making, making some observations initially uh, in 2006, um, there have been a lot of uh, information gather and a lot of uh, products developed by the Calypso team here at NASA Langley. Here is an example of the how rich can be a single orbit track, orbit, orbit track of Calypso. It's an example of June 9, 2006 of an orbit track passing from moving from uh, South, uh, South Africa across Africa and, and until the until the Mediterranean Sea. You can see here <clears throat> that uh, the latitude is shown here. So we move from the north here to the south here, from north to south. And here, <clears throat> as we, we come across Africa and the tropics, we see some expected features. We see serious clouds uh, near, near, near the TTL or near the tropopause, which are likely coming from convection. convection. Convection transport moisture from the ground to the upper atmosphere. And, and the cirrus cloud are visible on the Calypso uh, curtain. Those cirrus cloud, why do, are they cirrus cloud? Why do we classify them as cirrus cloud? Because of the optical pro properties. If we go from up to down, we see that we look at the attenuated backscatter, the total backscatter. The perpendicular backscatter <coughs> gives you an information about particulate uh, shape and the, another backscatter measurements at 1064. And when we look at the backscatter at 532 and 1064, we show that the, we see that the backscatter values are very similar, which is consistent by the fact that those particles which are measured by Calypso are very large particles and thus very likely serious cloud because they depolarized. On the contrary, when you look at biomass burning over South, South Africa, you see that the biomass burning layers associated with very weak uh, uh, backscatter at 1064 and almost no depolarization, which is an indication that, that what the layers that measure by Calypso are smoke layers. And the dust layers, which uh, are seen uh, when the orbit track is crossing North, North, uh, North Africa, and they are seen by high depolarization and relatively high um, <clears throat> backscatter at 1064. So here we see the <clears throat> richness, the how rich are those information to derive information on, on aerosol and clouds. I won't go into too much details, but <clears throat> it was interesting. I was when uh, Dr. Rahman was, was talking about that students have to obviously try to understand the concept of the LIDAR system. This workshop is going to be about that. But we also see that the whole part about retrieving information from the raw data is a very important job. And here in the US, we have 
there is a team of more than 20 people who are, who are working on deriving LiDAR products, products that can be derived from the raw data that the LiDAR measures. And that's, I think it's also critically important for students to understand from LiDAR initial raw data, how to derive information, which then can be used either to be compared with other observations or to be to be to validate climate models or aerosol transport models. So there is an all area of expertise that need to be also developed in terms of um, LiDAR derived products. From Calypso, there are three main products from level one to level three. The level one are usually the calibrated products. And as we move to uh, <clears throat> the second layer, level two, those layers now are detected. They are detected and we want to know their geometry, uh, basically where they are in the atmosphere, what's their base, what's their top. When they are detected, we also want to derive their properties. And especially we want to derive a very important information, which is the aerosol extinction, because the aerosol extinction can be, com can be associated with radiation models to understand the relative impacts of aer 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 aerosol, the radiative, and then their climate impact. So understanding uh, <clears throat> their property is very important and deriving the aerosol extinction from the initial backscatter is also very important. So the whole process of the level two product from Calypso is to try to discriminate between cloud and aerosol and apply a, a value, a value <clears throat> which is called the LiDAR ratio to derive the backscatter from the extinct to derive extinction from backscatter. And this LiDAR ratio is not directly measured by the LiDAR. It has to be used, it has to be uh, looked and, and, and assumed for each aerosol type. So before, as, before associating a given layer with a LiDAR ratio, the Calypso team is uh, subtyping every aerosol depending on their property. And here is a broad, a uh, summary of how the algorithm works to identify errors, aerosol. The identification is based on the three properties, on backscatter, 532 to 64, and depolarization. And after those information, and based on the location of the measurements, the, the aerosol layers are subtypes into six different types, pollution, smoke, dust, polluted smoke, clean and marine, and, and clean continental, where all the, the category. And here we have an example of the frequency of occurrence of dust in the Calypso data, uh, uh, the, the depolarization of aerosol layers. And we see that dust is usually associated with high depolarization, while uh, smoke has a lower depolarization, just because, <clears throat> the, because of their shape, smoke, and, and size as well. So, here is also an important part of, uh, has been an important aspect of the Calypso mission was to uh, validate those observations with uh, high spectral resolution LIDAR. So the, the LIDAR which have been flown on uh, aircraft has been used to validate the LIDAR ratio. <clears throat> so other type of LIDARs with high spectral resolution do not need to assume a LIDAR, a LIDAR ratio to derive the extension. The extension can be measured directly. And for that reason, those LIDAR are useful to validate uh, Calliope aerosol types or the, and the associated uh, LIDAR ratio. And here are all the flights which have been combined where in red we see the Calypso uh, LIDAR ratio for different types of aerosol and the distribution, frequency distribution of, uh, of LIDAR ratio derived from aircraft measurements. We see that when we use only a single value for a LiDAR ratio, we see that in reality, the LiDAR ratio for clean marine or clean continent dust has a distribution. So that's already, in, already including some sort of an error in the algorithm when we assume one value. But, but that's the, 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 the way that, that the, the algorithm in, is implemented to derive the extinction. We see also that some, some aerosol types like polluted dust has a more complex distribution than clean marine, for example, where the distribution is more narrow here. So we see that assuming a LiDAR ratio is also, um, is introducing some error in the retrieval to derive extinction. So it's important to keep this in mind. So as I said before, I think the way that uh, the strength of the Calypso space LiDAR has been able to derive
derive the vertical distribution, global vertical distribution of aerosol in the atmosphere. It's important to know the, the distribu this distribution because their atmospheric lifetime and global transport depends on the distribution. The vertical distribution of aerosol obviously has an impact on the radiative forcing and on cloud and precipitation. So the vertical distribution of aerosol has been varied widely between models. And here is a, a, the vertical distribution of aerosol derived from model simulation, where we see that some models tend to transport aerosol higher up in the atmosphere, some models tend to, re, tend to keep those aerosol at lower level. And being able to have calypso has been extremely important to validate and pinpoint what, which model <clears throat> are not performing well. Let's go back a little bit of some history about uh, uh, observation of aerosol from space. When we start from the 19, late 1990s, only observation of aerosol from space that was <coughs> could be performed from um, high, high uh, resolution uh, spectral radiometer, also known as AVHRR, was done over the ocean because the, the dark surface provided by the ocean provided Con good contrast with the aerosol from which the aerosol um, properties uh, could, be, could be derived. And that's very important because uh, as we have moved along uh, those uh, spectral radiometer like MODIS, uh, aerosol optical properties or thickness could be derived over land by using dark target. That's been a very important uh, improvement. And so as we move again, we also see how Calypso has provided now a new level of information, not anymore about the only 2D structure of the distribution of aerosol in the atmosphere, but the 3D, the three-dimensional distribution. And this is an example of how those aerosols are distributed in terms of aerosol optical depth. Uh, so the total, that's an integrated value of the amount of aerosol in an atmospheric uh, layer. So between zero and zero five kilometers, we see that aerosol <clears throat> are, um, maximum over um, the Atlantic from, from dust transport, but also over Asia, uh, over India and over China. If we look at uh, <clears throat> between one and 1.5, we see uh, some more dust uh, here from uh, the Arabic Peninsula. So as we move forward, we can, can really understand now where are those layers located and how do they move, how they are transported. And of course, uh, Calypso makes measurements not only during the night, but also during the day. However, the measurements during the day uh, carry much more noise. And it's relatively simple to understand is that at 532 nanometers during the day, you have a lot of light coming from the sun and the lights from the sun scatter by aerosol or particles are introducing <clears throat> some noise <clears throat> into the LIDAR uh, observations. So the nighttime measurements are usually much more reliable from Calypso than the daytime measurements. So the dynal cycle of aerosol from Calypso is still something that the Calypso team is trying to improve, but there are still some limitations. Um, <clears throat> there have been a lot of comparisons between Calypso and some other instruments, spaceborne instruments. And here I'm, <clears throat> I'm showing some comparison between Calypso uh, AOD and MODIS in different conditions. And overall, I won't go into too much details, but there are always some difference between <clears throat> measurements and, and, and always trying to understand which one is, is, which measurements are better than others is always challenging. Here we see that MODIS is 20% higher than Calypso most of the time. Whether understanding if it's an issue with MODIS and Calypso is, is still a debate. So I think uh, I won't go into too much detail. What Calypso has also brought is some new observations over areas where there were no observations. Um, <clears throat> all the measurements from uh, those uh, spectral radiometer are based on UV backscatter. So you need, you need to, for the measurements to take place, it needs to be the daytime. 
However, it's not always day everywhere on Earth. Of course, if you look at December, January, February over the polar region, it's always night. So Calypso, compared to another instrument like MODIS, has have brought new information about the distribution of aerosol during the nighttime over the polar region, which is really important. Uh, <coughs> as I said before, really one of the strands of the Calypso spaceborne LIDAR has been to derive the vertical distribution of aerosol. And here is an example of mean extension, annual extension in 2008, derived from Calypso, over ocean only and over land only. <clears throat> and what we see is that this, the vertical, this, there is more aerosol transported at higher altitude over land than ocean. <clears throat> there might be several reasons for that. First, <clears throat> we know that the aerosol emissions, especially dust, smoke, are emitted mostly over land, while <clears throat> aerosol in the over ocean, mostly marine aerosol, may have less, uh, may be emitted with uh, less concentration. The other aspect is the tra transport over land, convective transport tend to uh, be more efficient and eventually transport aerosol at higher altitude. So on the, <clears throat> on the lower side, the fact that we see more aerosol over land at higher altitude might be an indication of transport by convection. And here is an example of those vertical distribution of aerosol in 20, 2008 over the Eastern Pacific, South America, Africa, <coughs> Europe, and India. During the month of June, July, and August, I'm sorry, we see that aerosol <coughs> tend to be transported <coughs> at quite high altitude, up to six kilometers here, especially. Uh, about the Himalayas. <clears throat> so it's really important to see how convection here and the monsoon affects the distribution of aerosol. And, and I think <clears throat> Calypso <clears throat> has been providing uh, very important information to study the effect of the monsoon on aerosol distribution. Calypso dust observations are really important. And I think the dust observations are very robust because dust is um, <clears throat> sensitive to depolarization due to the asterical properties of dust. And so Calypso has been widely used to study the dust transport, especially from Sahara and Arabic Peninsula. <clears throat> As I said before, the purpose of having space-borne measurements or any measurements is also to validate aerosol mo numerical model simulation. The numerical model simulation allows us to understand how the atmosphere works and uh, the transport emission affects the aerosol distribution and especially how we can use them to predict the future, how they can be used to predict future climate. So being able to assess <coughs> the distribution of aerosol has been, from those models have been very important. Very sorry for my broken voice now. <clears throat> but we see that from Calypso that a number of, of models have not been able to to accurately <coughs> simulate the distribution of aerosol. And so uh, CAPSO has been a very important uh, tool to actually validate some of those model simulations, which are which is really, uh, really important. <coughs> now come the part where really I've been working a lot through my, my career when I started at NASA and during my PhD in France. It's mostly aerosol, how aerosol has transported in the upper atmosphere and how they affect climate. There have been a, an international initiative, and I think I want, by, by, by showing this figure, I also want to, want to make the student aware that obviously um, our atmosphere has no boundaries and, and, and being able to collaborate and study the atmosphere uh, through different um, organizations, through different collaboration is very important. And uh, me, myself, I had a lot of exchange and a lot of collaborations uh, with Indian Institute. And, and unfortunately, the pandemic stopped a little bit this, but I'm very hopeful that we'll be able to reconduct some of the work we have done. <clears throat> so one of the, those international initiatives we've gathered uh, experts throughout the world is called CIRC, the Stratosphere Sulfur and Sodium Climate. And here is a depiction of how we think the 
aerosol budget in the stratosphere is modulated. Volcanic eruption, we see on, on the right, and are taught to inject volcanic ash and, and volcanic SO2 at high altitude, which can be even eventually converted into sulfate aerosol. But we know also that convection and the transport of gas precursors, such as sulfur dioxide, can also lead to aerosol formation through some gas to particle formation. So <clears throat> really understanding the impact of a volcanic eruption and pollution on the aerosol budget has, has occupied a large part of my, uh, uh, my research. And here is a, an example. So <clears throat> why space-borne space observation are important? They are also important to look at the long-term impacts of aerosol on uh, the Earth atmosphere. Here is an example of the impact of volcanic eruptions on the stratosphere since the late, um, since the mid 80s. And we see that by combining space-borne observations uh, from European uh, observation <clears throat> and American observation, which started in the uh, mid 80s, have been very important to understand uh, the, how the aerosol budget in the stratosphere is modulated by volcanic eruption. It was important to realize and we knew that just after Pinatubo, the stratosphere was highly impacted by, is highly impacted by large volcanic eruption. But we also show that smaller volcanic eruption uh, <clears throat> at a, on a regular basis have also had an impact on the stratosphere and climate uh, during between 2000 and 2010. Another really important aspect of the research we have been doing on aerosol in the upper atmosphere is to understand eventually how aerosol pollution, how pollution in Asia can eventually make its way into the stratosphere. I think we, we kind of have understood that large and smaller volcanic eruption can impact the stratosphere for, for a long time, but over the uh, since since 2000, since since the early 2000, the mid 2000, sorry, we also discovered that uh, aerosol are announced above the Asian monsoon region every summer. The announcement that we call the Asian Tropopause Aerosol Layer is visible between the Eastern Mediterranean Sea to West Africa and is encompassing a large fraction of Asia through a, a large scale circulation called the Asian Monsoon Anticyclone Circulation. And we have worked a lot and conducted field experiments in collaboration with NARL in Galanki, uh, with uh, the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Hyderabad, as well as uh, the uh, Hindu University, BHU, in Varanasi, and other lab uh, in uh, Northern India, the Physical Research Laboratory. We work together to try to understand and derive the composition. And we organized several field campaigns to do that. Between 2014 and, and 2018, I had a chance to travel to India uh, very often, and we were we conducted several balloon measurements, uh, balloon campaign, to try to understand, to try to validate satellite observation, and to try to enhance our understanding of the properties of aerosol in the upper troposphere and lower stratosphere. And I think I'd like to reiterate what Dr. Rahman said about being able to. Also, not only <laughs> relying on satellite observations, but satellite observation and ground-based observation and airborne observation, uh, in-situ observation, are all complementary to each other to understand how, how the atmosphere works. And, and the, the mo basic motivation for those field campaigns we organized throughout the world to study volcanic eruptions, but more particularly in India to study the data, was really to validate those satellite data and also to enhance and improve our understanding of um, aerosol. And here is a quick example of what we have done, for example, to validate uh, satellite observation from, from uh, Cape Calypso Space Bomb LIDAR. We did fly a small, lightweight backscatter sound on board those balloons. This, this sound was really uh, the size of small shoebox, uh, less than 500 grams, so very easy to fly. And we flew it 72 times in two, between 2014 and 2018 in India to try to understand if, those, if the in-situ measurements were kind of validating uh, the satellite observation. And on the right here, we found that indeed that the ETAL, the announcement of aerosol within the ETAL region was also confirmed by, by in-situ backscatter measurements. 
I've done a lot of other type of, of measurements, but for the sake of, of time, I just wanted to show you uh, those type of um, those bad type of comparison. And here it's <clears throat> probably good for my voice that I'm going to conclude. That really, I, I I really thank again the organizer for giving me the opportunity to to deliver this talk. I would like to thank Dave Winker, who actually prepared most of the slides uh, for during this present for this presentation. Really, Calypso uh, <clears throat> has brought an unprecedented view of the tree structure of the atmosphere for more than 16 years now. I had a chance to start my career as a young PhD student to start looking at Calypso. And here we go, uh, 16 years later, with some white hairs now, Calypso is still there, and I'm still looking at those data, which has been really fabulous. Calypso has allowed to derive the vertical distribution of aerosol and clouds in the atmosphere, thus more volcanic ash across the planet, and has improved our characterization of the aerosol 3D distribution and the validation of global transport model. I also want to emphasize that the combination of Calypso with other sensors is critical to assess the long-term impacts of aerosol in the atmosphere, in the troposphere, but also in the stratosphere. And finally, I want to also, <clears throat> as I know that the, this, this um, a workshop will focus on LIDAR observations. I also want to make students realizing that's really important to also combine different set of measurements, that the complementarity between LIDAR measurement from space or the ground and in-situ measurements, which are really critical to enhance our understanding of, of the atmosphere. And again, thank you uh, for your invitation and please feel free to ask me any questions. Thank you. Hope that everybody could hear my talk. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll have to do it again. <laughs> Dr. Ratnam, can you hear me? We at Ahmedabad can hear you, but not sure about the Chennai. Then I'll have to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, it's only two o'clock in the morning. I think they are able to hear, but the uh, microphones they are switching out because of that report. <laughs> oh.